What's up guys? Today we're going to be going over myocardial infarction. So this is also what's called a heart attack. And so as I was kind of mentioning to people who are watching this video live or podcast live, whatever your medium are watching this on, it's going to show up on the boards in some way, shape, or form. Either it's going to be a safety question as in your patient's having a heart attack, what do you do? Or it's going to be more associated with unstable angina, which is going to possibly cause a heart attack, or it's going to be associated with just understanding what the pathology is, what's going on, the coronary artery diseases that can cause it, what's happening in some way, shape, or form, this is showing up. So be aware of what's going on with a myocardial infarction. So some quick anatomy before we get started. Essentially what's happening is you're going to have a thrombus clot emboli lodged into one of the coronary arteries. And so we understand that the coronary arteries are the arteries that supply the heart with blood. So if the heart's not getting blood, it's not pumping blood to everything else and then you die. So that's kind of what's going on when you have a heart attack. It's going to be a clot is getting stuck somewhere in the heart which can also be exacerbated by plaque buildup. So we can see this picture right here. We have a little clot that's also stuck in the plaque. So that's not helping it because remember with coronary artery disease, you're having arterial sclerosis um, or even atherosclerosis. One of the sclerosis eyes um, is going to be causing fatty plaque buildup within the arteries themselves, therefore decreasing blood flow, increasing blood pressure, which is why hypertension is one of the leading causes of a lot of these heart conditions, any sort of heart condition, even strokes and stuff like that hypertension is one of the leading causes. That's why we freak out when your blood pressure is really high. So understanding that the coronary arteries are the ones that are mostly affected and guess which one ends up being affected the most, the one that supplies the left ventricle. So the left coronary artery tends to be the ones that get blocked the most, which is unfortunate because it's supplying blood to the part of the heart that pumps blood to the rest of the body. So when those cells die, they're done. So they're not pumping anymore. They're not contracting anymore. We got a problem. So What's happening is you're having a clot lodge somewhere in the coronary arteries, which is causing ischemia to the area. And then therefore the myocardium, so the muscle, muscle layer of the heart. So remember we have our endocardium, which is the lining that's right inside of the heart where the um, ventricles and the atria are located. And then you have the myocardium, which is the muscly part. Remember myo is muscle. So the muscly part of the heart, then you have the epicardium. So, and then you have the pericardium surrounding everything. So understanding that that's kind of what's going on with the heart and that the heart cells end up dying due to ischemia to the area. So what's causing this, as I said before, a plaque buildup or thrombus lodging into that spot is going to be what's causing a heart attack. So not good. Coronary artery, artery disease is just going to make that even worse because it's going to narrow the uh, arteries with plaque buildup. So it's causing ischemia to the heart muscles. Remember ischemia is a blockage of blood flow. If blood's not getting to the, the, the heart muscles, the heart is not receiving any oxygen and therefore the heart is going to end up dying. So we don't want those heart muscle cells to die. So that's why we got to catch this as soon as possible and get EMS involved. Um, this happens a lot with somebody who has a history of angina pectoris. And so remember, that's where they have the chest pain that's alleviated with nitroglycerin. If it's stable, if it's unstable, it's not alleviated with nitroglycerin. And that's why you need to go to the hospital um, because it could end up being a heart attack. So that's why there's that those big safety things when it comes to that. So understand that angina pectoris is a temporary ischemia of the heart, which can block up to like 90% of the heart. And then um, the nitroglycerin is going to get rid of all of that chest pain and hopefully allow those arteries to start flowing blood again. Um, the mechanism of how that happens is beyond what we need to know as PTAs, but here's kind of what's going on. So that's going to put them at a higher risk factor of developing that. Um, and then the heart muscle cells begin to die. So that's not good um, because we need those heart muscles to pump blood. And so where these heart muscles die, the area surrounding that is called the zone of infarction. That's why it's called a myocardial infarction because it's the myocardium having that infarction, which is where the uh, muscle cells are dying. So this zone of infarction indicates where the infarct is and then the extent of the damage to the surrounding musculature. So if we have a bigger zone of infarction, that means that we've had more muscle cells dying. So that's not good. So it's just kind of showing like the, in, the zone of infarction, they would say the zone of infarction is located um, along like the left ventricle or something like that. That would be just where they're indicating what happened. So here are the key risk factors that are going to contribute to the possibility of you having a myocardial infarction besides the history of angina pectoris. 
hypertension is like the big boy. Um, that's is why we get scared when people's blood pressure is super high, um, because that can cause a lot of problems from strokes to, uh, aneurysms, heart attacks, kidney problems. It's just bad. So there's a long list. So hypertension is one of the bigger ones, uh, smoking due to the fact that there's an increased risk of clot formation. So that's why they, um, very much worry when people are smoking that they'll end up throwing a clot somewhere obesity. So that's another one that's going to have a risk factor. And that's due to the fact of diet causing possibly high cholesterol buildup. That's another one. So that's why they want people to get their blood tested and check for high uh, cholesterol levels, just to make sure everything's okay. Um, stress will also increase the risk of heart attacks. That also kind of increases the risk of hypertension, which then increases your risk of heart attacks. So stress is just bad in general. Don't be stressed out. Don't work that high stress job. It's just a job work somewhere else. Um, diabetes mellitus because of the increased risk of problems with blood flow in general, that's going to increase your risk of a heart attack. And then, uh, just general inactivity increases the risk of obesity, increases the risk of high cholesterol, increases the risk of hypertension. Like it's just like one thing after the and another, it's just like, which is the deciding thing that causes it. So all of the things are bad. What does it look like? So, um, any of the individuals that possess any of those previously mentioned risk factors are probably going to be who you're seeing is having a heart attack in front of you. Generally, it can literally be anyone though. That's what's scary about it. Here's an interesting fact. And I think the boards actually like cares about this interesting fact. Um, most myocardial infarctions occur in the morning. So right after an individual has woke up in the morning and they're thinking that's just because you've been laying still for a while. If something's stuck somewhere, it's getting dislodged when you first wake up. And then they have a peak incidence between Thanksgiving and New Year's, which is kind of interesting because my grandpa died of a heart attack the week after Thanksgiving. So I thought that that was a really interesting fact. Um, he passed away like 20 plus years ago, so it's okay. Um, so I like told my mom that she's like, oh, that's interesting. So yeah, during the stressful holiday season, that's when we're seeing people uh, end up getting heart attacks. So that's why we've got to be like really careful about some something like that. That increases the risk factor. Um, chest pain. So the, here's what the, all of the things that you would see when it's like, what does it actually look like if this person in front of me is having a heart attack? Chest pain is like the big one. They're feeling like this is like a squeezing, a tightness in their chest. Like their heart's literally being like, like squished by somebody. And so it's like super tight. And a lot of people complain of this elephant sitting on my chest kind of feeling. So just like heaviness, lots of pressure. Here's the thing that the boards cares about for a differential diagnosis between this and other pathologies. Pain will radiate into the left shoulder, up into the neck, and sometimes down the left arm. That's the stereotypical presentation of a myocardial infarction, usually going to present like that in males. Now, understanding that if it's the right shoulder, we're looking at like gallbladder liver problems more. So left shoulder, we're thinking heart attack. So that's the big thing. If you're seeing like pain radiating into the left shoulder, this tight, like a, the patient's showing up to you and they have this, they're like, yeah, my like left shoulder, like really started to hurt. And it's hurting at rest. Here's the thing, pain at rest, because like, they're like, oh, I lift my arm overhead and then it hurts. But if they're just sitting there like, man, my arm hurts. And then like, they're sweating and they look like they're about to throw up. You're like, oh God, this is a heart attack. This is bad. Um, so understand that shortness of breath and fatigue. This is just due to the fact that the heart muscles dying. There's not blood being pumped bad, not good exacerbation of unstable angina. So remember with the unstable angina, that is where they do not respond to nitroglycerin. You can give them three nitroglycerin tablets each five minutes apart. If they do not have symptoms resolved, that's why we're calling EMS because this could be an exacerbation of unstable angina causing a heart attack. And so they could be having an infarct happen. And you got to make sure that it's happening. It can be unstable angina that is not alleviated with rest or nitroglycerin. So typically uh, with stable angina, the nitroglycerin will resolve their symptoms and also just resting usually resolves their symptoms as well. With unstable, it does not happen that way. That's why we're worried about a heart attack. Again, the patient's going to be looking pale and sweating and they're looking like they're going to throw up. Like you're looking at them, they're like clammy and you're like, they don't look too good. Like something's wrong. Um, and so that's why we're thinking heart attack. So put these, these symptoms, if you're seeing them all line up together, usually the board's going to give you three symptoms. If all three symptoms check off the box is probably what it's going to end up being. If you see just two, and then there's another one, that's a random one. Maybe we're not thinking what we're thought originally. So read all three symptoms and see what's going on. Note though, 
and the boards will be nice and ask you about the typical presentation unless it's literally asking this question what is the difference in presentation between males and females and i'll be like it's different it's weird uh in females the presentation is different and this could radiate into their back their shoulders or they could just not even know they're having a heart attack it's pretty scary um and so sometimes it might even just like feel like upper back pain or something like that um or like stomach pain like it refers in weird patterns in women um so you got to be careful because the boards isn't going to ask you about where it could radiate but just understanding for your patients what's going on is this a heart attack uh what kind of history do they have with things being very careful about that again the boards that they're going to ask you you just have to understand it's going to be different in females probably radiating in, in between the shoulder blades or something like that understand that in males usually they follow the typical presentation which will be pain radiating into the left shoulder arm and neck kind of thing so that's what we're seeing for what does it look like so how are we treating it we're not treating a heart attack we're noticing the symptoms and we're getting EMS as soon as possible. First of all, if the patient has a history of angina pectoris, we are going to administer um, nitroglycerin sublingual tablets to them every five minutes for no more than 15 minutes. If their symptoms have not resolved, so we can only give them three nitroglycerin tablets because we give people a lot of nitroglycerin, their blood pressure is going to tank and they're going to pass out. Don't do that. So understanding that if they have the prior history to give them the nitroglycerin, if it's not working within those 15 minutes that we talk about, we're calling 911 because we're like, oh, this isn't good. Um, so, or if we're in like an inpatient setting, you're alerting like nursing staff and everything, you're calling a code and whatnot, um, doing your things, but you're getting EMS involved because this is bad. Um, understand that with the patient who's having an active heart attack, as long as they're still conscious, we're monitoring them. We are calling EMS and everything. Uh, CPR and AED are only necessary if we see the patient become unconscious and lose their pulse. So we're monitoring them. We're like something that we learned. This isn't a boards thing, but this is something I learned in one of my CPR classes. If somebody's having an active heart attack to encourage them to keep coughing because that coughing sensation helps keep the like heart pumping. It's like kind of weird that increase in intra-abdominal pressure helps keep blood flowing and helps the heart move. So encouraging the patient to keep doing that. Unfortunately, usually EMS doesn't arrive in time. This patient probably is going to end up passing out. I just have an AED ready if you need it. Have people ready to do CPR if you need it. Have the appropriate people called um, because we're probably going to end up being doing CPR on this patient. Now, um, the patient, once they're finally in the hospital, they're going to be administered thrombolytics. Those are the clot busters to help break everything up. And then once they're done with their thrombolytic regime, they're going to be put on anticoagulants to avoid another clot forming because that will help. That's like a blood thinner. So it'll help just keep, um, blood flow and everything, keep a thrombus from forming again. Again, when the patient goes into the hospital, they're probably going to have a balloon angioplasty with a stent placed in. And the stent is just used to push all the plaque out to the side. So then the blood can flow through um, and to help like also if they need to bust up the clot or something like that. So that's just to help get blood flowing again. So we're not doing that, um, but we have to understand like what happens during an angioplasty that it's a, usually a, a catheter inserted through the femoral artery all the way up to the heart to like figure out going on. Um, so that's kind of like what's going on. So we just got to be aware of that, of what's going on with this patient and then how they're being treated. So afterwards, after we've had our emergency interventions with this patient and we can like, you know, actually treat them in cardiac rehab, we're going to reintroduce this patient back to low level activities, very calmly work on cardiovascular endurance, progressive strengthening. We're going to follow the protocols in place that they ended up having open heart surgery because maybe they had like four, like hundred percent blockage in like four arteries or something crazy like that. Um, we got to follow those precautions for this patient, which means no use of the upper extremities to push up from the chair because we don't want to like use their, ch their chest or anything. Um, we want to have, they'll have lifting restrictions on them, no pec stretching, all that stuff for if it's an open heart surgery. Generally, we're following the stages of cardiac rehab for this patient, seeing where they're at, working at the appropriate METs for this patient. And just like, you know, telling the patient, hey, this is your best bet to go do cardiac rehab. Um, and so helping them just kind of get back to being able to perform their ADLs without getting out of breath. We're working on relaxation techniques because remember stress was one of those cause, like, causes and factors and everything. Breathing, you know, that diaphragmatic breathing, purse lip breathing, all of that stuff, just we're chilling. We're doing some chill stuff with this patient, just calm everything down um, and just make sure because this patient has had some big cardiac event happen to them, they're probably going to be on the meds. So being careful if it's an anticoagulant, antiplatelet, something like that, um, that they're going to bruise more easily and just being careful that they're not going to bump into anything or do anything where they're going to fall or something like that because they can have increased bleeding, bruising, all of that stuff, not good. 
if they're on any sort of like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, any sort of like um, things that are going to lower their blood pressure. Remember, they could be orthostatic hypotensive when they stand up because we could overshoot by accident. So understanding how those medications could impact treatment. With this patient, since they've had a heart attack, since they've had a cardiac problem, we are going to take vital signs with this patient because what is one of the leading causes of having a heart attack, everybody? If you're on the podcast, say this out loud. If you're watching this, say it out loud. Hypertension. We got to take a vital sign, take their blood pressure, take their heart rate, take their pulse ox if you really want to, but blood pressure, heart rate, those are the big ones we want to take with this patient, seeing where they're at. How are they doing? Are they having any problems? I start blood pressure looking out of whack because we don't want somebody who's had a heart attack to have another heart attack because it's bad, very bad. Anyways, key words, guys, for understanding myocardial infarctions. Remember, pain is radiating into what? The left shoulder, the arm or the neck, I just did that wrong, arm and neck. So left arm, neck, shoulder-ish area, left side, heart attack, right side, visceral organs such as your gallbladder. So we're thinking problems when we got the left side, left side is ah bad. And remember that's pain at rest. For women, the presentation is different. Remember pain between the shoulder blades, unusual kind of pattern for women, just understanding that that's kind of what's going on because we want to be careful that we're not going to kill our female patients because we're like, oh, that's not a typical presentation of a heart attack. They are not having one. They could be. History of angina pectoris. Again, that's going to be one of those risk factors that we see with this patient that we're like, oh no, this is something that could cause it. Cause they're already having ischemic attacks with the angina pectoris. That means it could have just a gigantic ischemic attack and have it be a heart attack. So just being careful with that, understanding the nitroglycerin and how we use it. And if it's unstable, we're calling EMS. That's why we don't want them to be having a heart attack. Remember the signs that the boards are going to use and the different words that they're going to use to describe this is going to be tightness in the chest, diaphoresis, pallor, that's like white in the face and you're looking bad, fatigue, nausea, and vomiting. If those are all showing up together again with like pain in the left arm, we're thinking heart attack, bad. Angioplasty with a stent, just kind of understanding that that is one of the interventions that will be used to treat somebody who's had a heart attack, just seeing what's going on. And then if pain does not alleviate with nitroglycerin, that's where we're seeing this could be a heart attack because it could be an unstable angina. So we're going to be careful with that. And we're going to call EMS services. So ready for a sample question, guys? A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient in an outpatient setting who had a myocardial infarction eight weeks ago and has completed cardiac rehabilitation. What is the most appropriate intervention to perform with this patient first? One, diaphragmatic breathing exercises. Two, three minutes on a recumbent bike at no more than two mets of intensity. Three, obtain blood pressure reading, or four, work on sit to stand transfers without using arms. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that one. All right, guys, so the answer is to obtain the blood pressure reading because this question is asking, what do we do with this patient first? So they had a heart attack. First thing we want to do is when we're with this patient is to just take their blood pressure, see what's going on, make sure it's good and it's safe to continue. Remember, taking blood pressure on patients who have history of like any sort of heart cardiovascular problems and everything is essentially don't pass go or collect $200 until you've done this kind of thing. That's kind of what's going on. So Remember, boards is a safety test. We got to be safe with our exercises, obtain blood pressure first. Awesome. Then maybe we, if it's a little high, let's say, let's do some diaphragmatic breathing, see if that calms everything down. If it doesn't, then we can't do therapy today. Um, so we just want to make sure we're being as safe as possible with this patient. Blood pressure and vital signs in general are a great way to make sure that we are being safe when treating this patient. So remember, the question is asking, what do we do first? First, we take blood pressure. Then maybe we can do some of this diaphragmatic breathing. Yeah, let's say that they're um, stage three or four cardiac rehab, biking on the recumbent bike for three minutes at no more than two mets. Yeah, that would be good for those patients, you know, kind of get them a little bit more car cardiovascular endurance. It's good. Working on sit to stand transfers without using arms. That's great if they had an open heart surgery or something like that. There's nothing in this, there's nothing in this question to indicate that they did though. So that might not be the best answer. Also, we see what do we do first? We're obtaining a blood pressure reading because we want to be safe when we're treating this patient. Because if we're not safe when treating this patient, 
then we got lots of problems. All right, guys, I hope that this was helpful in explaining what's going on with myocardial infarctions, and I will see you guys on the next one. Take care today, guys.